not very group friendly, like often petroleum based school that people don't hey, know what to do with. Use the mic, would you? I don't have a mic. Oh, I have a mic. <laughs> Thank you. easy to dispose of in a kind way wherever in the world the material ends up. Um, we're a small you know, niche manufacturer of, of specialty materials and we ship our materials all around the world so it's important to us what impact we make. Um, the last bit that's really important to us is keeping the materials unique and interesting so folks that are connoisseurs of 3D printing, folks that want to level up on their experience and quality, um, that's who we're, we're there for. Those are our people. All right, so we're actually born out of an engineering firm called Proto Plant. And what that, uh, what that does for us, sure. Being born out of a engineering firm means that we bring a particular set of skills as designing and building machinery. That's what, uh, that's what Dustin and Aaron have done for a lot of years. They've t torn down um, machines and tried to learn about them and hack them and put them back together and make new machines for basically their whole life. Um, and they carried that into Protoplant, which then um, did work for other folks. And the part of the goal of bringing a new filament to market is defining our own product for the first time and doing what we want to do. So what we want to do is, is, is start you off in that journey. We kick-started the brand four and a half years ago. So we're going to start with a little video that um, gives you some perspective and gets you started. Hello Kickstarter, our project is Protopasta. My name is Aaron. And I'm Dustin. We are here to bring exciting new materials to the 3D printing world. Carbon fiber filled PLA, high temperature PLA, and polycarbonate ABS alloy are the first three materials we are offering. Carbon fiber PLA is a mix of PLA resin and short carbon fibers that prints well and makes for very stiff printed parts. High temperature PLA is an easy to print material with additives that can make it withstand much higher temperatures than normal PLA. Polycarbonate ABS alloy takes some skill and high temperatures to print with, but can make incredibly tough 3D printed parts. These materials are available in spoolless 250 gram coils. This weight makes shipping extremely affordable and is a convenient quantity for exotic materials. For easy printing with Protopasta, we are offering unique reusable folding spools that do not require disassembly to change material. A rigorous and scientific evaluation of materials used in 3D printing is something that we think is vital and yet mostly lacking in the industry. A large part of our project is to offer real data on how these materials perform as 3D printed parts. We are testing our materials to determine heat deflection temperature, impact resistance, flexural strength, and stiffness. Detailed data sheets for each of our materials are available. To bring you these exciting new materials, we designed and built our own filament factory. We researched commercial extruders and modeled our equipment off these designs to fit within budget. The heart of our factory is a screw that we designed and machined. We combined this with a heated barrel, pressure gauge, and drive system to make a complete extruder that is affordable, fast, and reliable. Once the material is extruded, it needs to be drawn to the correct diameter, cooled, 
and spooled into finished product. We use a combination of conveyor belt, pinch roll, spool winder, and diameter measurement feedback to control size and wind up filament. All of this is managed with a touchscreen Raspberry Pi control panel that we designed, built, and programmed. We are confident in our ability to manufacture quality filament and scale the process up to meet demand. We now need funding to add additional factory automation and purchase raw materials in bulk. Thanks for watching. We are excited to share this project with you. Awesome. So this four and a half years ago, Thank you. Yes. These guys, these guys were thinking, you know, forward thinking in, in having this um, th going on about this venture. I'm going to, okay, there we go. So uh, the, just to give a little perspective, at that time, 3D printing was really hot on Kickstarter. And um, it, this, was, this was really kind of the rush of 3D printers into Kickstarter. And everyone was getting funded and a lot of money. And uh, I guess there was probably some massive fails too. I, I, I don't remember all the details exactly, but there wasn't a lot happening in the material side of things. So Dustin and Aaron identified this, this, this hole, um, opportunity which could be filled. So even though 3D printing had been around since the 1980s, the, the launch of it into the consumer space and the access to 3D printing was, was drastically changing but the access to materials wasn't quite yet, and so here was an opportunity to impact that. So what we'd like to do is go back through that video again. This time we're gonna pause as we go through and tear down some of the photos. There's some great, like, there's just some great things to talk about and geek out about throughout the photos. Um, and we'd like, if you have some interest or s interject some, I don't know, just some ideas or some questions, please feel free to have a conversation with us as we're going through and talking about what we see. Yeah, I, <coughs> it's, I think it's important to note too that um, Alex said it was born out of an engineering firm, but that was, that was me and my dog doing like consulting work for, uh <laughs> for various companies. I mean, we did, did some cool things, but um, so we, we probably had, you know, five or $10,000 to play with to, to put all this together and, and make um, enough progress on the manufacturing of filament to, to feel confident that we could launch a Kickstarter project. So that's why we had to hack everything together out of um, torn down hardware, <laughs> basically. So. Because um, you had to do this pre Kickstarter. We did, yeah. We, we were, we'd seen a lot of Kickstarters that we kind of stalked Kickstarter projects for a long time, and there's a lot of people. A lot of them deliver a year late and not with what they said. So it was really important to us to deliver on time, which, yay, we did three times. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but so we wanted to be pretty confident in that. So this, yeah, let's just go through and um, this is, uh, let's see, it's kind of a double image, but yeah, here, um, it's, okay, yeah. So one of um, the materials we wanted to release was was a high temperature version of PLA that was still easy to print with, which at the time was pretty new um, in the field. There's there's a lot of them out there now, but it's a it's it was a material that crystallizes when you heat treat it, um, and this is the the video representation we decided to come up with. It was. Um, uh, the, the idea was originally to do Salvador Dali clocks, but <laughs> we, we, we ended up with this. <laughs> but uh, if, you play, if you play it a couple seconds for, I guess they just watched it, but uh, it doesn't go on that. Just so, so, yeah. so that we kind of des designed and made all our own testing hardware also. So. But these are like the same kind of materials, just one is more amorphous and one is semi-crystalline, but then crystallized to change the structure of the material, which gives it rigidity past uh, fast transition. Yeah. It's something we've actually built on uh, and it's a unique characteristic of, of our material set.
peel the part uh, in the oven as it's changing, touch it, squeeze it, uh, and then all of a sudden feel that it's like firmed up at the same temperature in the oven, which is really kind of a wild, a wild thing. So and that's a toaster oven, a very <laughs> fancy piece of glass. <laughs> Right. Right. Exactly. And you don't have to print it at a high temperature. Um, we actually rebranded <laughs> it as so HPPLA and heat treatable for higher temperature resistance. Right. Because everyone, the first question is always, well, after, can I eat toilet pasta? Um, the question <laughs> was, <laughs> like, uh, do I need to print at a higher temperature right, right. for HPPLA? Yeah. So, yeah. so, and this is what we originally um, tested our materials on. like. We didn't even own a 3D printer. <laughs> so this is actually a three-axis knee mill, like a Bridgeport-style milling machine uh, running Mach 3 with a, a homemade hot end in the spindle of the machine. So um, we, we built our own hot end and uh, tested our own materials um, without a 3D printer <laughs> on a block of wood. But, but with so the industry standards we pay. So well, yeah, 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 it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's like because it seemed like there was a need for it in the marketplace. It was, um, I guess, we didn't for a long time. We have. We do now. <laughs> I s I've seen the light, but. <laughs> I really found that entertaining um, in the in the beginning. I mean, Dustin loves CNC. He relies on CNC, and he was just like, "I don't even know why people like this stuff." Like, I mean, CNC makes so much more sense. It's faster, better materials. You know, like, uh, wh why would anyone want to three D print? But now, I mean, as he said, he's converted. Yeah, we we have some intricate parts on our production line. We use three D printing now, um, but we, you know, yeah. It took it took some time. Um, yeah. Uh, and this guy, so we uh, used quite a few Harbor Freight dial indicators to do various things. Here we're doing just flexural testing, basically, um, on that. We also use the same fixture to do the heat deflection temperature measurements, yeah. but in hot oil. Yeah, later, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it is its own in the future. It is. And we started with these small coils, but um, the price point was so low that we weren't going to get enough backers. So we actually introduced, um, by, by popular demand, 1K one, one spools on plastic spools um, because that's what everybody wanted at the time. Now loose coils are back in vogue, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it so it goes. But that introduced a whole new problem for us. It, then we had to make you know, a whole kilogram of filament without any defects <laughs> instead of 250 grams. And, and, so and learn to wind on a spool. And right? learn to wind on a spool. And you know, it turns out a sanding belt isn't the appropriate tool to haul that off on. So <laughs> um. So this is, this is us again. But in the background there, you can that big orange thing is actually like a, a, a very large uh, CNC lathe that we, we took the, the spindle out of the tailstock and put an extruder barrel that we made in the tailstock and spun the screw in the spindle of the lathe. And that's how we, <laughs> that's how we first uh, made our first extruders. So... Just gotta kinda get through that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. There's that loose coil man. Right. Those right. Those horrible to work with. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we we didn't actually fulfill the Kickstarter project on the um, on the lathe version of the extruder. We we iterated on that a couple of times. We gave our how long did we give ourselves? Six months. Six months so to fulfill the Kickstarter. And to produce the actual reward material and to buy the raw material and pay for ourselves to like you know do this for six months. Yeah. It, it, uh, so yeah. 
It was a challenge. It was a challenge. <laughs> it was, did I deliver everything on time? We delivered everything on yeah. time. To, um, um, yeah, yeah. We're probably on the point oh five. But it's material it's dependent. Material dependent. So, uh, Alex, so Alex loves glitter. Yeah. <laughs> because of the texture. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it turns out if there's big chunks of glitter, it's a little harder to uh, maintain. But I, I don't know. Keith's been doing a lot of our support bees and Alex, and we don't, we don't get people that have a problem. That so. No, <laughs> but but we were pretty focused on on you know we wanted to ship people things that they could use so we we worked pretty hard on it, um, yeah yeah, um, and it, it wasn't very long before we were on to the next way to haul off. I don't think we made any like saleable material on the sanding belt. Yeah, <laughs> we'll we'll get more to that in a, in a minute. Yeah. So. Do you want to talk about this setup quick at all? Oh, this is this is an impact testing machine. So it's a pendulum, basically, and you, you lift it up and drop it. And if it didn't hit anything on the way, it would come to almost the same height as where it was. Um, so if it hits the sample and breaks it, it doesn't go to the same height. And that difference in height, you can actually calculate how much energy it took to break the sample. And that's a, it's a good way of measuring impact resistance, which PLA has very little impact resistance. So, um, but we, the PCABS has very high impact resistance. So, <coughs> And in the background, there's an oscilloscope that on the center there, there's a quadrature encoder that measures the angle. And um, so it's I don't know for sure. I yeah, I think it was somebody else's because they didn't make any yellow filament. So you, you guys did your first day with eBay and some filaments here to right. see what was out there a little bit. Yeah. Um, the mission this is that same setup we saw before, right? With the this is just the hot yeah. oil for the heat combustion. Yeah, but okay. instead of like stiffness, we're looking at well, I guess it is stiffness, but at elevated temperature see if the high temp PLA actually did something and, and it did so <laughs> so this is actually that CNC milling machine again we turned it into a uh, instron machine and with a bathroom scale load load cell <laughs> but you can see on this one the waves turning in the background and <laughs> So you still do this. We still make our own screws and our own extruders. Uh, we got a, like a Haas VF3 four axis milling machine that we do the screws on. So, um, which I guess we um, we've managed to wear a few out because uh, we run like um, stainless steel powder and iron powder and carbon fiber and but now we we actually plate them with. It's like a electroless nickel boron nitride alloy that's like Rockwell 65 or something. Um, so that if the plating stays on, which it doesn't always, it, it they don't wear out. So <laughs> um, this is more Aaron's world, um, making all those motors go the right speed. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I could uh, talk at length about the uh, the technical details of the. Um, the system that we use. Uh, <coughs> from my perspective, it's all about uh, controlling machinery with a computer. So um, <coughs> you want a computer that holds, um, you know, configuration data. Uh, you want a control panel. Uh, you want um, the control panel in software so that you know, since we're uh, making this up as we go along, we can change it real easily. You know, we don't want like a control panel with actual dials on it. You just uh, rework the code and you, you get a new um, way to control the, the hardware. So what we started out with is a, uh, a 
Raspberry Pi. Um, and we just uh, controlled stepper motors um, through the, I think it was the SPI interface, directly from the Raspberry Pi. And so that's, that's what you see here. This is our Raspberry Pi interface. Um, and as we went along um, trying to solve problems, uh, a lot of this has been just problem solving. We had uh, problems to solve, we had a, a, um, a goal to get to, and um, we, we just worked out ways to do it. Um, and it usually involves stepper motors. Our, our general, our stock solution to every problem is just add a stepper motor. That's just like, so we were, we were controlling, uh, I don't know, six or eight stepper motors on, on one production line. Um, so that uh, became pretty unmanageable. Uh, we were using um, stepper motor controllers that uh, you sent commands to to um, control the speed. So you'd send it a command to say, run at this speed. Um, and the, uh, the brains in the stepper motor control board did the work. But we found that it was not flexible enough, and the boards were not robust at all. So we, the second evolution of this um, went to um, these uh, Texas Instrument um, stepper motor controller boards that um, were much more robust. They're, they're tough. I mean, they've got like really real discrete MOSFETs on them, and they, uh, they work great. The catch is they are step and direction. And when you get into step and direction, um, you need really tight control over the timing. So uh, we went with a, a separate microcontroller. Uh, this plugs in. This is kind of this is called a, a Texas Instrument launch pad. So you guys probably know about this. I've, I've played with them. This is the MSP430. We started with the MSP430. We programmed it to do the step and direction to run our motors the way we wanted to do it. And so that just plugs right in. Um, the only problem is we needed to talk to a computer that had our uh, library of um, like settings, configuration for how we wanted to run it. And we decided to use USB to uh, control all of that. Um, that turned out to not be such a good idea. <laughs> Trying to control industrial machinery with USB is just not. And you know, we, we researched the spec, uh, everything. Um, oh, sure. Uh, <coughs> Where was I? The um, oh, the USB. Yeah. Well, it uh, it tended to disconnect uh, at really bad times for no apparent reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. That, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's. Right, it, it, it doesn't really, like I looked at the specs and I was, oh, well, like it goes 10 meters or whatever the spec is. And you know, you can, you can have up to eight or 16 devices on a single thing and you can use these hubs and hook it all, oh, it'll work great. But uh, no, it, it, it didn't. Um, doesn't like being in the same box with like a 15 horsepower rear diffusion drive. <laughs> <laughs> right, oh, you have a question? Uh, we we have we actually did um, we're keeping it uh, closed source for for right now. Some of the early stuff is actually on uh, my GitHub page, so um, you you could Google um, Google my name. I think I'm uh, recursive. You could find the source code, but no we yeah we we don't have that all up i mean i think if there's a if there's enough interest if there's like a genuine if, if somebody wanted to to do something like i'm a big believer in, in the open source movement and open source software so if if we saw um if somebody came to us and said you know we'd really like to control some stepper motors to do um a project um we could uh open it up but but right now it's it I mean, frankly, it's, it's quite a bit of work to actually um, open it up. We're always changing it. It's like just um, kind of chaotic. So uh, it, it could be uh, open in, in the future. Yeah. But it's but pretty amazing that where you've got it to now with the Ethernet. 
Yeah, yeah, our current version, we, we were the, um, we were actually, so we, we use Ethernet now, and we, we started doing this uh, just before, I think, the big IoT thing came. So we, we were building Internet of Things before it really got uh, popular, and, and now um, most of our, yeah, 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 so, so, so yeah, 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 so. <laughs> So I don't I don't know how much how much detail yeah, should we yeah. get into should we move on and come back to it all right yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. some questions yeah, yeah. also yeah, I mean um, that's kind of a fun video at the yeah end. so we brought uh, some more we brought some more photos to sort of tear down um, some of the information we're gonna already have covered so we may step through those photos uh, some quick more quickly than others and then we'd like to to show you a couple more videos along the way um, so is there anything more to say about this photo here or should we I'm just gonna I'm just gonna step through. Yeah. yeah so. so we talked about this, you know, wh where we started with the Rasp Pi and, and the brains of, of the whole deal and and uh, several motor controllers. Um, this is actually downstairs at our table. Uh, check it out. It's got a lot of dust on it. I it's mostly carbon fiber dust, so you know, don't touch <laughs> it. <laughs> but it adds effects to show how how old it is and hasn't been used for a while. So we've moved on, um, which is which is super cool. Um, this is actually our first extruder that stood alone, right? Second. Second? But I don't know where the first one The we first one was on the sawhorses. We don't oh, <laughs> yeah. We don't have a photo of the saw, saw, the sawhorse extruder, but so sorry. Yeah. But it's a haul off. Okay, we're, we're off the sanding belt, but still not ideal. <laughs> Counter-rotating <laughs> wheels. It looked yeah. really rad, but was, well, Dustin was the only one that could string the material. Yeah, and that's not a good thing. <laughs> um, yeah, with the differential shrinkage and stuff, all the, so there were two, these two wheels and then the pinch roller at the end, and they all had to run at different speeds, and it had to be calibrated perfectly for, like, the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we see it getting a little more complex with some feeders added, um, you know, a, a high-capacity tube to the top of the wheel. Yeah. Right, <laughs> we were able to make, you know, several pounds at a time at this point. <laughs> <So> <laughs> And then, and then we, s you know, tidied things up a bit further, and or polished them up a bit yeah, more. So that's Rev. I don't know next, <laughs> um, uh, but it's still like a little tough for maintenance. Like really hard to get the screw out of. Um, if you need to, to maintain it, um, it's a little tough. So that was that was fun. A lot of it was standalone, <laughs> not not connected to the software, right? The, yeah. the heat air settings was all done just right. out of the machine, so the right motor so speed. It's hard. It's really hard to see on that, but it it's is. got a PID control, like you know, yeah, the Amazon PID controller. You know, um, so it's a glamour shot of thermocouples, which you would think it would be easy to just like get thermocouples that work, but it it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so that was a thing. <laughs> it's been a thing um, to get them to attach to the barrel and be actually isolated electrically but not thermally um, and to um, right and to <laughs> to read them out um, with the, the you know the thermocouple voltages anyway we, we've, we've, we've we've incorporated some yeah yeah really low level voltages um, so this uh, upgrade, yeah. another uh, uh, an upgrade in progress so the Aaron like disassembled the Harbor Freight uh, dial indicator and reverse engineered the proprietary serial bus <laughs> to talk to the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I, I, help I, I found a lot of it on the internet. So yeah. the, the internet is the most amazing thing. You just type <laughs> stuff in and you can find out how to do almost anything. Hey Google, I don't know what yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, well, well almost. Except well. for that. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Um, but it's right now it's piggybacked with, uh, we still use similar things to the, the old green thing. The, um, thanks. The, uh, which is just a linear quadrature encoder, which is a lot easier to deal with than the, the serial data and in much more real time. Um, that's, uh, that was supposed to be an upgrade, but it's an optical touchscreen, which uh, right. is activated when bugs land on it. So not useful for, again, not useful con for controlling things that matter. <laughs> but, but, somehow, but somehow we got this far, and, and by the end of, of this point, 
we had completed all the production of our Kickstarter reward. Yeah. And um, you know, we we decided, hey, just because our Kickstarter's over, why not do another one, right? Should we <laughs> skip this one since can, it's ten forty six? Yeah, we can skip and this video. Yeah. So you guys can check it out. We launched a conductive uh, material. It's still, I don't know, as good as any conductive that I'm aware of out there that'll print in your PLA type printer. So there's, it's 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 a to be honest, it's one of our more challenging materials to produce and produce consistently, but folks like it, they buy it, they do things that we don't understand with it, and it's <laughs> pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, and coming out of that, though, we realized a fair bit of what we were doing is mixing materials, and we needed a more purposeful machine in doing a good mixing. So we, we uh, had another eBay find to buy a twin screw uh, extruder, which uh, we rebuilt as well. I'm just going to kind of step through. Um, yeah, there's lots of cool things I could talk there. about with, with the twin screw extruder thing, but um, it, it was a, it was a, pro it was a project. There. Yeah. Yeah. It was a project. <laughs> but at the end of it, we have an extruder on it, you know, for as inexpensively as I think that you could ever yeah. have such a thing um, with a lot of labor, obviously, to make it right. But um, it was, it's a huge, it's been a huge cornerstone in capability yeah, in I the mean business. Yeah, we run it every day um, and make, we compound all our own material. I mean, I think that was... From raw powder and, 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 a, and pellets. A, a lesson learned, like, if you, wanted, if you want it done right, you just have to figure out how to do it <laughs> in a lot of cases. <laughs> so we do that for metal composites, we do that for the colors, it's all from the raw pigments. Got that figured out. We came back one last time here to the um, to the extruders to, to polish them up, to clean. Oops. Yep. To clean them up, um, looking all tidy, and uh, get more software integration. Really, so the software was doing all the work of the PID and motor speed, um, and we celebrated <laughs> reaching that point. Uh, and then we started to duplicate, and we started building out our filament factory, which is, you know, what we've been doing sort of since. And um, we'd like to, to wrap this up Yay by Ash Park. Yeah, Ash Park. Purple circuit boards. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Eventually, so we got to creating our own uh, purpose, purpose designed uh, board for the work that we do, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's our, that's our end of extruders. I think we want to celebrate here to wrap it up because this is our last slide. Um, a year ago, we moved from our little like 1,000, wh what started as like a 1,000 square foot garage to like 2,000 square foot takeover to then a big leap a year ago to 10,000 square feet facility. Um, this is our first spool material um, coming off the lines at that, uh, the new facility that we moved into uh, last April. And um, we want to share this video about where things are at now. And these are all our concentrates we make from scratch.
Super cool. It's a lot of fun to, to have other much more talented uh, in, in like, I don't know, filming people to, to come and share with us. Uh, it's, it's, it's very cool to invite folks in and have them share in the process. Um, so 
That ends our presentation. We, we would like to thank you for joining us. We'd like to, to thank you um, and invite you to visit us at our website, um, to visit us downstairs, to visit us later if you want to geek out more about 3D printing uh, and um, grab a beer before you head over to the Autodesk event. Um, I think we're about out of time, so... Uh, as, as, as long as we're able to hang out here, sure. Conductive is good for like lighting up LEDs is kind of a, the way I, I like to put it. So the, it's, a, it's 15 ohm centimeters, which means um, a 10 millimeter piece of the 1.75 millimeter filament is, it's between like 2 and 3K. So... It's higher depending on which way you measure it after you print it, yes. Um, but we haven't really characterized it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's also very good for, like, makey-makey type things. So. Yeah, if we had time, we would have showed the video of all the applications. Uh, right, right. <laughs> but you can uh, check it out. You can Google uh, Protopasta Conductive Kickstarter. Right. Um, and then the color variation. Oh, you want to? Yeah. You're, you're the color, color guy. <laughs> what, 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 I'm sorry, the, the, how do we deal with or, or manage? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so you gotta get the, you gotta get the loading of how many, like, beads or what percentage of concentrate you're putting in. So we have to dilute concentrate in order to get, like, a good mix, uh, enough, like, uh, resolution, if you will, uh, bits, I I part of the total. So if you're trying to put in, like, one or two percent of a color, um, then you're going to get variegation. If you're putting in like more like 10%, then you're going to get a lot more even distribution of that color. Yeah, we take we, so we start with a you know full concentration powder. We put it in at like 5% just to get it in plastic, and then from there we dilute to either like 1.25, 0.25, or 0.05% concentrations, and use them appropriately to get the right consistency and the right saturation. And then, th what was the last question? Sourcing plastic pellets. So we use like industry standard PLA that's um, you know of high quality, made here in the U.S. Um, we actually aren't chemical people per se, and we really appreciate having a reliable, like, good, easy to process supply of PLA. Um, that is uh, that is definitely a foundation that we don't have control over per se, other than um, you know always choosing the same source and not trying to go cheap or, you know, it's, it's, it's been reliable and so it's been great. Recycled plastic is interesting. It's just a lot more variables to work through and uh, it's questionable in like what ways it makes sense. What we'd like to do is start to capture more of our own waste and reuse it to start. Um, but we want to produce a high quality product and, s and we also want to do something that we can sustain a business on. It's, uh, if you start with bottles, for example, one, there is such a huge mass uh, waste production. Like our, our local bottle recycler, Orpet, um, has like 40 truckloads of shredded bottles a day. We can't hope to consume that in 3D printing. Um, and by trying to recycle that post-consumer waste, we have to deal with the particle preparation, we have to deal with like cleaning. Is there any labels of different, or is there any other plastics mixed? Is there any sticky stuff on there? We have to dry it out. There's, it's a whole nother level of complexity to make sure you get a, a good final product. I'm not sure that 3D printing is the best application for recycling of plastics in general. I think there's, especially when you look at bottles and scale, I think like building materials makes a lot more sense um, as, a, as a volume consumer. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting, but um, you know, it's one of those things that we kind of tread lightly in, 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 in learning about and in, you know, committing in as part of the business. Yeah. Humidity. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we def, uh, like, humidity is not good for plastic uh, in general. Um, PLA is not terrible in uptake of moisture, but we definitely make sure we start with dry materials to get a good uh, result. We actually do in our V3 HTPLA material have an additional uh, additive which acts as a bit of a toughener or, or uh, impact modifier. It also helps flow and it happens to be hydrophobic so it also makes the PLA even a bit more um, humidity resistant for a more consistent printing experience. If you want the best possible printing experience you really ought to look at taking better care of the material conditions and have like a dry box and, and keep the, the conditions stable. But some of the more mainstream materials are generally pretty tolerant of like ambient conditions. Well, the moment that you, if you're printing with the material exposed and not in a bag, then it's up, you know, it's immediately starting to take up moisture depending upon how much moisture it wants to take. Um, you know, that, that um, it may or may not help. Um, putting it back in the bag after it's been out for a lot of hours, the, the, it's not going to take the moisture back out from what I understand. So you really need to dry the material again. And um, yeah, it's, I mean, the best solution really, if humidity is a concern, is to always keep it uh, dry and not let it be exposed and get wet. But a lot of times, too, people think that humidity is an issue and they're having some other problem with the 3D printer. It, it very well likely is not, not humidity. Um, why old filament doesn't work well? Uh, gosh, there's so many reasons why things don't work well. But um, old filament can get embrittled. It can get dirty. Uh, you know, uh, an oiler or a cleaner is a good good idea too to like make sure the filament quality going in to the to the printer's consistent. Um, I, I I don't know honestly with our with our setup, um, we've used material that's been like out of the bag for years and are able to just print it. So I, I think hardware adds a big, hardware and settings adds a big element of, of challenge that sometimes people th think is material, but it's actually machine or settings to, um, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of ways that things can go really wrong or really right, so. Any other questions are required to be asked over a beer? So uh, you should, you should uh, this, this is pretty close to where we're gonna be tonight. Um, so if you don't have plans and want to talk more about